In about five years' time, you may well be boarding this aircraft. It's the British Aerospace 146, and it's the first new civil aircraft that Britain has developed for nearly two decades. It will seat up to 100 passengers, and by the 1990s, will probably be as familiar to businessmen as the Trident or the short-distance Boeing 737. So far, it hasn't flown. The first flight is expected later this summer. But for the past year and a half, Nationwide has been watching the development and building of the aircraft. Over the next four weeks, we'll be seeing, from the inside, exactly how a new airliner gets off the ground. Tonight, in the first of the series, Bernard Clark looks at the history, marketing and design of the British Aerospace 146. There was a time when aircraft were designed of long hours and crazy risks. This is now the de Havilland Museum at British Aerospace Hatfield, but it was also the old grey shed where Geoffrey de Havilland designed many of his original aircraft. It was his boardroom, his sales office, and quite often his bedroom too. One man working on his own, private enterprise at its most romantic. He took the decisions himself, and if they later proved wrong, he alone carried the can. Now that was all right when aircraft cost about a pound a pound, or a thousand pounds for a prototype. But as the Second World War approached, it became obvious that a new system was developing. That new system can be summed up in one word, committee. In 50 years, the progress in modern aviation has been so breathtakingly fast that now no one person could hold the design of even one wing in their head. The discipline of today's aircraft designers is no longer the up all night individual brainstorming for ideas. These days it's more important to be able to manipulate a committee or to make sense of a printout. This is where an aircraft starts with a prediction of sales. You may think that the 146, a relatively small, very ordinary sort of aircraft, isn't the sort of thing that today's modern, ultra-competitive airlines would be after. But this computer would disagree. In 1978, the total worldwide market was predicted to be 1,200. The manufacturers here expect to corner a third of that market. That's a total sale of 350. And from the point of view of British Aerospace, that makes the 146 a good aircraft. Because a good aircraft is one that sells. The history of commercial airlines is a brutal one, where boys' own dreams lie shattered on the assembly line. Timing is all. Imagination, a sadly expensive luxury. The first mass production airliner was the DC-3, which first flew in 1934. Like the Model T Ford for cars, the DC-3 completely changed aviation. Altogether, 11,000 were built and from the Dakota onwards, airliners would have to be sales-oriented, like the Viscount, built by Vickers in Surrey. 
Although an unspectacular aircraft, it was precisely tailored to its market. This Viscount airliner, made by Vickers Armstrong, is being inspected by representatives of Capital Airlines, one of the largest civil companies in the United States. The Viscount is powered by four propeller turbines and can carry up to 53 passengers. The American visitors were so impressed with the workmanship, economy and design that they signed a contract for three of the aircraft to the value of over a million pounds. And what's more, they've taken an option on a further 37. Through the 1950s, it gradually sold a total of 450. The timing was right. The size, technology, price were very ordinary, but it became perhaps the most successful British civil aircraft ever built. At roughly the same time, Britain was leading the world with the first civil jet aircraft, the Comet, which also first flew in 1949. It was the centrepiece of the British aircraft industry, confirming a worldwide lead in jet engine technology. But it was ahead of its time. The Comet was shattered by a series of crashes, culminating on the 10th of January 1954, when it crashed off Elba. Investigation showed that metal fatigue, a problem unappreciated previously, had caused the crashes. The Comet never really recovered, and by the time the faults had been rectified, it was recognized as too much, too early. It was a commercial disaster. But the Americans had learned from our pioneering mistakes. Five years later than the Comet, Boeing launched their 707. The timing was exactly right. The 707 sold nearly a thousand and captured the commercial jet market for the company. When the British aviation industry tried to fight back, it was consistently beaten, usually by the well-established Boeing. The Britannia, obsolete before it carried a single passenger, only 80 sold, too little, too late. The Trident, beaten by the Boeing equivalent, because through the 707, they'd already cornered the market. And then Concorde, where imagination went beyond economic constraints. It was a commercial disaster of enduring proportions, virtually killing off in one plane the full-size, full-range British airliner. But there's one area where the British aircraft industry has been successful, the feeder liner. A fair proportion of the air passenger market is for short hops, journeys that would take hours by car or train, but perhaps 40 minutes by plane. It's especially useful to, say, a businessman who will be continuing his journey on another flight, feeding the passengers in to the major international airports. The HS748 and BAC111, both British, have between them sold over 500, but they're old. The 146 is designed to take the feeder liner into the 1990s. 18 months ago, it already existed in a wood and cardboard mock-up, put together in complete detail to act as a three-dimensional sales room. We're now in a position where we can say to an airline, such as the people I've been talking to today, um, what the aircraft has to offer. What is it going to do for him? Now, he, I've just left a meeting where he has asked very specifically for us to simulate his airline on our computers. And I've just collected a batch of information. And some of our analysts will be operating the airline for him, but on our computers. They will fly the airplane over his routes. They will estimate times, fuels, the number of passengers to be carried, uh, where those passengers are going, not how they lose their luggage. Uh, they will work out the cost of operation for the capital, the crew, fuel, oil, landing costs, the fare the passenger pays, how much money the airline actually gets from that fare, and whether the airline makes a profit. So the sales staff at British Aerospace actually run their own computerized airline, flying the 146. They've already been doing it for years with timetables, ticket costs and passenger projections. 
to check that the dozens of target airlines will get answers to the most important question. Will the 146 make a profit for them? So, you have the right aircraft, but for a particular part of the market, we're not building 747s or Concords. Um, we are building a 146. We're not building the European Airbus. Now, the airlines we select are the ones we use for our market research. There are particular types of airlines operating particular types of aircraft. So the confidence has been conditioned in before we actually go to see them. It's an enormous risk, isn't it? No, no, it's a straight commercial practice. We're not in the business to make aeroplanes. We're in the business to make money, if we do. Do you really think you will? Indeed. What should be different? The computer tells you that. No, I tell them that, because that's the result of the British aviation industry. From the marketing team, it goes to designers, whose job it is to work out how to build the aircraft the marketplace is demanding. Here, the truth of a new aircraft is further reinforced. There's little of inspiration, little hunch, or even precious little doubt about how an aircraft is designed. Well, the shape comes from really looking, first of all, at the body size. If we have to have 70 seats, that determines roughly the shape of the body. Having determined that, we then have to lift that particular payload out of certain airfields. That means we want a wing, and we want a wing of a certain area. So the next thing to determine is the wing area. Having determined the wing area, then various things follow in the wake of that. The fin area, the tail area. All of this comes from the initial determination of what sort of wing you need. Having determined the wing, you've then got to decide, of course, where you put the engines and how many engines. So the initial configuration depends on selecting whether it's two engines, three engines, or in this case, four engines. Having got to the configuration of the broad outline of the aeroplane, you've then got to decide where you put the wing, whether it's going to be a high wing or a low wing, the tailplane, whether it's going to be a high tailplane or a low tailplane. And this really comes about by looking at the overall performance and the cost levels of the aeroplane. Now, we've chosen a high wing on this particular aeroplane because it has a number of advantages. It means that we can get all the lift off the wing because it's clean along the top surface. Do you not at all think we'll put the wing here because it would look more attractive that way? No, I'm afraid that doesn't come into it at all. Not we at put, all? We put the wing in the most efficient aerodynamic and structural position to suit the particular airline. The aesthetics of the aeroplane don't come into it at all. Is there nothing that isn't totally functional? Um, well, the only f um, areas of the aeroplane that are not essentially fun functional are those areas which the passenger sees. All of the interior of the aeroplane is very much stylized to meet a customer uh, aesthetic point of view rather than anything else. But the hardware on the aeroplane, the pieces of the aeroplane that do the work, they are purely fixed essentially on the job they have to do and to do that with the minimum amount of cost involved in doing it. In 1972, they had everything they needed for the aircraft. They knew the markets, they had the shape, the size, the wings, the engines, they even had the tyres. In short, in 1972, they could have gone for a first flight in 1976. But there was just one thing they didn't have, the money. And for that, they went to the government. In our next film on the building of an airliner, we'll be looking at the politics of the 146, and in particular why it was on and then off, and why in 1981 it still has to make its first flight.
doesn't look much like a hangar, does it? In fact, you're probably saying that surely that building has nothing to do with the building of an aircraft. There are no drawing boards there, no wind tunnels, no spirit of aviation. But in fact, these days, most large aircraft projects begin or more likely end with that place. Because Parliament controls our purse strings and a new aircraft needs a very large purse indeed. Now the 146 has been more brutalised than most aircraft by Parliament. First it was on, then it was off, then it was on, then it was off, then it was on again, then it was off again, and finally it was on. They started by looking for a replacement for the DC-3, the Dakota, probably the most successful aircraft of all time, which was getting old. In 1959, de Havilland designed the DH-123, squeezed out by a competitor. Then the DH-126, but no suitable engine could be found. Next, the HS-136, never quite came together. Then the HS-806, still nagging doubts. And later still, the HS-144, beginning to get warm, but the engines died with the collapse of Rolls-Royce. So finally, 12 years of talking and testing later, it was going to be the HS-146. That was in 1972. The view of an aircraft we're all used to is for a while unimportant. The 146 becomes a balance sheet and immediately enters Parliament as a prospective investment candidate. In short, they have to go to Whitehall and ask the civil service for £100 million. Well, I think, first of all, they shrink in horror uh, and they say, oh, my God, uh, uh, but let's talk about it. I don't think they ever categorically turn these things down outright. I think uh, the initial request is made. The civil servants are not unaware that such a request is on the way. As I said, they've probably been aware for some months that the program is in the offing. And there then ensues a very long series of fairly tough, discussions, negotiations, if you like, at which uh, a case, a very strong case, has to be made by the aircraft manufacturer in both marketing terms and manufacturing terms to the civil servants. And very often, even perhaps in political terms as well, because they can turn round to the civil servants and say, well, look here, if you launch this particular program, it's going to create X thousands of jobs, employment potential in this area and that area in various parts of the country. And that particularly would have a very significant impact upon the civil servants thinking. Producing a new airliner is at this stage a two-way process. While committee rooms fill with smoke in Whitehall, the actual work continues at the factory. Although there was no proper go-ahead, by early 1972, the wind tunnel was already hard at work. All this might have proved wasted if the civil servants and politicians turned it down. What was finally agreed was that half the money would be government and half come from the company itself, Orca Sidley. So on the 29th of August, 1973, the absolute go-ahead was given. £92 million was to be invested, providing 20,000 jobs. The 146 was probably on its way heading for a first flight in 1976. Most people thought that it would have a reasonable chance of success, given two things. Given that, first of all, the aircraft was undertaken reasonably quickly, and given also that there were no other factors that would interfere with it. Over the next two years, the work proper got underway. There are some fascinating areas in an aircraft factory, like the undercarriage testing rig. As the undersecretaries, deputy secretaries and government ministers came and went, the undercarriage itself just kept on going up and down, until it almost destroyed itself. And the wing tanks continued to sploosh and splash right through the fuel crisis of 1973. Because of OPEC and political events thousands of miles away, the wings themselves were beginning to look like they might never fly. 
In the election of 1974, the spectre of nationalisation and the wheels came down for good. Sir Arnold Hall, chairman of Hawker Siddeley, decided the aircraft would no longer be profitable. He cancelled it, despite the fact that the government had a 50% stake. Tony Benn was the secretary for industry at the time. The company um, said they had reassessed it and this aircraft would court disaster. And uh, they wrote to me and they said that the market isn't there, the costs will escalate, there'll be competition and so on. And as we were equal partners, if you like, with them, I called in uh, Sir Arnold Hall and Sir John Lidbury and went over it with them, insisted on our rights uh, because we were a partner, saw the shop stewards, who were brilliant because they knew that what they were talking about, it wasn't just figures for them, saw the Confederation of Shipbuilding and Engineering Unions, who were very committed because this was the only civil project uh, actually in process of development in Britain. Would you characterise it as a battle? that you had with Sir Arnold Hall and Hawke Siddeley? Well, you're making it very dramatic. I had a big argument with him. And uh, uh, you make that very personal. These things aren't personal. The workers held their breath and also held sit-ins. They seized the drawings, demonstrated, and shouted that this was more than just an aircraft. It was their livelihood. The struggle was furious. I took it to a cabinet committee and we argued it out. And uh, when you argued it out, it became absolutely clear that this was a very important element of the future of Britain as a manufacturing nation. We are so brainwashed now into believing that profit and loss this week and next week is what life is about. We forget that all the, uh, that the future of this country depends upon using our skill to make things people need that will keep us going. It ended as a classic compromise to cancel production work but to keep the design team going at government expense. The tools and jigs, though enormously expensive, would be kept intact. The 146 was on the back burner, waiting for nationalisation. Surely this is no way to build an airliner? Well, I don't think it is. I, I, I agree with you. I don't think it is. But unfortunately, it's the system that we have got in this country. It's the only system that we've really got because the manufacturers by themselves just simply don't have the money to do it. Nationalisation came at the beginning of 1978 and there was little surprise that by July of that year the 146 was given a new lease of life. Hawker Siddeley and BAC had become British Aerospace. The government were now calling the shots. If it's not a success, then surely won't the accusation be that if it hadn't been for that Mr Ben worrying more perhaps about jobs, then we wouldn't have spent the money on an aircraft which is now not successful. Well, I don't say the BBC will say that. I'm almost certain they will. They'll have a programme about That's not answering uh, about the question, it. No, but I mean, the truth is that uh, you talk about risk-taking, you take risk. You're bound to take risk. There's no future without taking a risk. And uh, we are deciding, or we did decide then, and I think quite rightly, uh, to risk some public money on backing highly skilled people uh, and the finest aircraft designers and manufacturers in the world don't make any uh, mistake about that to produce an aircraft for which the, we knew there would be a need and it's coming into uh, service or coming into production at a time when the world's airlines are going to be re-equipping and uh, that is why I think it will succeed but I can't uh, guarantee anything, you can't guarantee anything in this world. The 146 has had, perhaps, a harder struggle into life than most aircraft. But there is a final ironic twist to the tale. During the years after the oil crisis, all airlines put off buying new aircraft. Had the 146 not been temporarily cancelled, it would have been too early. Now many of the world's airlines are desperate to re-equip their obsolete fleets. So, partly because of delays and indecision, the 146 has become what the airlines need a highly modern, brand new, small to medium sized airliner. Up to date, at exactly the right time. Had there not been the fuel crisis in the first place which resulted in the airlines buying moratorium and they had gone on buying, the 146 would probably have gone on. It was a factor of that fuel crisis of 73, 74 which really screwed the whole business. There wouldn't be any nuclear industry without public money. There wouldn't be any computer industry in Britain without public money. There wouldn't be an aircraft industry without public money. There wouldn't be a whole range of other technologies without public money. And uh, these people who say government should get off our back are the same people who queue up on Monday morning 
asking for 500 million, 100,000 million pounds to keep their industry going. With all the momentous decisions going on on the 146, start, stop, start again, nationalise and maybe denationalise, it's easy to forget the thousands of ordinary people it takes to make a modern airliner. Every change of plan means houses sold, schools changed, sometimes years of enthusiasm down the drain. In our next film on the 146, we'll be looking at those people, the plane makers. Tonight, the birth of a new airliner. Today, the British Aerospace 146 made its first public appearance as it was rolled out of its hangar at Hatfield in Hertfordshire. In his third report on the building of the 146, Bernard Clark looks at the plane makers, the men with the reputation of the British aircraft industry in their hands. Today, they rolled out the 146, a quaint procedure, the first time it's shown to the public. But more important, perhaps, today the Civil Aircraft Division of British Aerospace also held a press conference. Air Wisconsin, uh, a major uh, US regional carrier, have just decided to buy four aircraft and take an option on a further four. Uh, the US operator West Air have just announced board approval to purchase six with options on a further eight. A modest order, but significant, because the 146 has yet to make its first flight. A sign of confidence that the aircraft will perform as British Aerospace say it will, and that British workers can still build a competitive aircraft. Aerospace Hatfield is at first sight an ordinary jumble of buildings, 1930 Art Deco, with a dozen or more functional hangars spread around in disregard of any obvious order. In the centre is a runway, the only certain sign that Hatfield makes aircraft. Through the gate goes metal, plastic and paper, but that's not the real raw material. This is what makes aircraft people, thousands of them coming and going gradually forging an airliner from their craftsmanship and ideas. The aircraft is built in stages, first on paper on the drawing board, what you might call the optimistic view, how it should be given a perfect world. Next, it's built on computer. Although at this stage, the how they see it in the drawing office stage, no one takes too much notice. The computer tapes will be filed for future changes. The work proper starts on the carpentry bench. You're not seeing things. The aircraft really is being made of wood. All this work will be either burned, thrown away, or end up in a small museum. But not just yet. For the moment, the wooden mock-up is of the greatest importance. Claude, what's the point of making a wooden mock-up? Well, it's to save a lot of waste of time wasting good material. If we make it out of wood, it's far less price, far less cost than what it would be to waste the metal. What sort of things do you discover making the wooden mock-up, then? Well, well, the biggest things we discover is where, where we go wrong, the big errors we make before we, before we um, make the proper one. What sort of things? Like a pipe won't fit through? Well, it? That is correct, yes. It will foul perhaps a, a bulkhead. Although it's drawn out on drawings, it doesn't always prove exactly right. It has to be checked and checked again with a mock-up. 200 yards away, the operating problems are being smoothed away by another important member of the aircraft building team, the test pilot, in a wooden mock-up of the cockpit. If 
they do go, if they don't turn out quite as expected, then this gives us an ideal opportunity to recommend an alternative location which would be more convenient and it's rather easier to do that with a three-dimensional space model than just doing it on paper. The test pilot is not what legend has him to be. His flying qualifications are of course the highest. That much is taken for granted. But he's so much more. He's the guinea pig behind every control. It's his job to make it an aircraft that will feel right to every pilot. An aircraft that will fly uh, well. As you know, I've recently been assessing the rudder pedal geometry in the mock-up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found that the plane in which the pedals move is inclined to the floor, such that when I deflect the rudder bar, my heels tend to catch on the floor. And this could lead to uh, an inadvertent application of asymmetric brake. Well, because of jamming because under of the, your heel. Because the heel actually catches on the floor and then my ankle tilts forward. The uh, design team will have these inputs coming back. Alter this, change that. Every square millimeter comes under examination. The uh, design uh, department took the necessary action and in fact changed the shape of the floor so that one's heel no longer tended to be trapped and that you can just see if you uh, press your foot underneath the uh, rudder pedal there, you'll find yeah. that the floor has been chamfered away gently yes, so that, uh, in fact, as you move the rudder pedals, there's no longer a problem. Is it all trial and error? Well, it's, it's not so much trial and error, it's a, a process of iteration. You try a particular uh, compromise of design, you will then stress it, weigh it in the weights department and it might all be wrong and it might not be quite right so then you alter various areas and then you try it again and you continually go on doing this until you get the best balance there's no one area that you can get absolutely right you have to get the best balance so That's the whole thing is a compromise the whole thing is a compromise yes it certainly is it's a compromise against cost against weight against performance and against manufacturing techniques the detail is frightening and that's where the computers come in. 20 years ago, every change meant a whole new set of drawings. Now it's just the flick of a switch to slightly amend the tape. This computer, properly programmed, will do the work of 50 people in a tenth of the time. The final design, now on tape, is transferred to another computer in the cutting shop. Huge parts of the aircraft can now be sheared into shape without the touch of a human hand. To watch this machine automatically grinding out an aircraft to within a thousandth of a centimetre is to realise the enormous impact of technology. Instantly it's apparent why it costs 250 million pounds to develop. The grinding equipment, the computers, the aluminium, and above all, the people. A thousand people cost 10 million pounds a year, and an aircraft needs many thousand working on it, simply to get the first one built. Now, with the advent of computer-aided design, where we can actually draw these parts on the computer, and then transfer that data into an NC, that's a numerically controlled milling machine, then the milling machine can cut out this part exactly as the designer draws it. So the whole thing can be done more or less by computer? Well, it can. The, the process can be certainly speeded up through computers, but you have to have the designer thinking through each stage. The object is to use the computer to turn the draftsman's pencil into a machine cutter. While the heavier aircraft structure is chiselled, the more flexible parts are worn into shape, again without the touch of humans. Transfers to the required design are stuck onto sheets of aluminium, which are then submerged in baths of acid. The treatment lasts only a short time until just the protected pieces are left intact. This sheet will be part of the fuselage. If you, by accident, fell into the tank, all they'd find of you is the zip. Gradually, all the parts come together in the final assembly hangar. It's four times the size of the Albert Hall, and last summer it was just beginning to fill up. The very first 146 
was at that time just a nose cone. Now, we're actually standing more or less on the first aircraft, aren't we? This is the first flying aircraft, yes. Will this be the actual one that flies? This would be the first aircraft that flies. How do you, how do you feel when you look at it? Well, it's excitement, really. I mean, this, this is a new aircraft, a new conception. The machining of the frames and everything is new. The whole aircraft has got fail-safe angles so that you would never get cracks and pieces like that. And this aircraft is an ultra-safe aircraft. Trying to fit several million pieces together without them jarring each other causes a fair degree of friction. Usually it's two people talking, just occasionally arguing. There's a certain amount of abrasion as the metals bonded together and the personalities suffer from the struggle. One function's perfection is another function's loss. And by now almost everyone in the hangar has briefly forgotten that it's actually an aircraft they're working on. The first couple of airliners set each craft new, unexpected problems, which will be routine in a year's time. Do you, do you understand how, how it works, or do you just put it together? I put it together, I understand structurally how it works, and to put all the equipment in. But, but your being job a new really... aircraft, we have to feel our way through it as we start off. Do you make mistakes? We don't make many mistakes. You make Experience. some? Experience, we make some, everybody makes some, but all the mistakes are being ironed out. If we find that something's not correct or fitted, then it's, that, that fit is changed and we have a new part fitted. Is there a fair amount of to and fro there between On the first and aircraft, there's a lot of to and fro -ing. But once we lay this out for reduction, everything on this aircraft will fit correctly, everything will be right, and then we'll flow through with our production. It's very hard to believe that, like British Leyland, this is in fact an assembly line. It's much, much calmer much less repetitive and more thoughtful and sometimes the man with the spanner will have a phd so it doesn't matter to you now that you're making an aircraft oh yes and when the chaplain on one of his weekly tours gets into conversation it's rarely about darts or beer or religion um, you'll find that a lot of people here doing fairly ordinary manual jobs read the weekly or the monthly papers about aircraft. There are magazines like Flight and the Aeroplane. And recently, when the company had a series of lectures about the 146, the questions at the end from these kind of people showed uh, that a number of them actually do their homework. They care about the industry. Isn't that all a bit romanticised? Well, I think it is if you make plastic gnomes. But if you make aircraft? But I think if you make aircraft, there is still a small amount of that, uh, if you call it romantic, okay, um, but real depth to what people do. A commercial aircraft has a life of 25 years between the initial designs and the wind down of the assembly line. Many of these men will be here that long, helping perhaps 300 aircraft take shape and fly away. For them, the 146 will be half their working life longer than it takes to bring up their children. Just occasionally, there are high points, like the first flight or a massive order. Next week, we'll be looking at the final phase of an aircraft, how it comes together to meet the press and the public, the rollout. start with a quiz. What do the numbers 98, 106 and 121 have in common? The answer, they were all built here. The 98 was the Mosquito Fighter, the 106 the Comet and the 121 the Trident 
all built in this huge hangar at British Aerospace Hatfield. But the 146 will be assembled here. And assembled is the right word because these days few modern aircraft are actually built in just one place. The assembly starts with the nose section and cockpit, which is made at Hatfield. The rest of the aircraft will be joined on the back. The centre fit comes from Filton, and the rear from Manchester, and the wings from America. It comes from absolutely everywhere, doesn't it? Everywhere, even Saabs, Embra in Yorkshire. So it comes from Sweden, in fact, doesn't it's it? Sweden, yes. Why is that? Why can't you just make an aircraft in one place? Well. The complexity and cost of building aircraft nowadays, the cost of the aircraft had to be spread out completely all over the world. Does it make it more difficult to do it that way? It makes it more difficult to start off with, but once you've sorted out all your problems in between the factories, then you get a much neater and better and faster built aircraft. The wings are made in Nashville. They're really just sealed fuel tanks with as few complications as possible. And they're made in America for two main reasons. Firstly, financial. They cost roughly a fifth of the aircraft. And Avco agreed to underwrite a fifth of the risk to get the 146 contract. It also helps to get orders for the aircraft in the United States if parts of the plane are made there. Once completed, they initially head for Hatfield by road, three days halfway across America to New York. <music> Meanwhile, the fuselage, which the wings join onto, has a shorter journey. Down the M4 from Bristol. British Aerospace decide to build wherever they have spare capacity. With the failure of Concorde, there were thousands of workers available at Filton. The 146 was the perfect interim solution, so the fuselage was farmed out to Bristol. All this travelling down British motorways, American freeways, might seem a waste of time, except, of course, to the billboard artists. But it isn't. In fact, it's the cheapest way to build a modern aircraft. The aviation industry doesn't see distance like we do. An aircraft as raw material is very light for its value. Transportation, though expensive, is only a minor part of the total bill, even the thousands of pounds it costs to hire a jumbo. This 747 could be carrying 400 passengers. Instead, on board will be two wings for the 146. They're slowly swallowed up in New York at the Kennedy Air Freight Terminal. The plane belongs to Flying Tigers. You may not have heard of them, though they're one of the largest airlines in the world. They've got 14 jumbos, purpose-built for freight, and see themselves as lorry drivers in the sky. Once the 146 production line gets into gear, they'll be crossing the Atlantic with the wings three times every month. Gradually, all the pieces come together at Hatfield. The engines, originally designed for a helicopter, from the United States. The fin section from Bruff in Yorkshire arrives in time for the tailplane from Saab in Sweden. Bit by bit, the jigsaw is cut together. The actual joining doesn't take too long. Most of the time is devoted to threading the wiring through and meshing controls together. Here we go. 
You all right? Come in a bit, Jeff. Five years of building all over the world climaxes in the six months it takes to make it a complete aircraft at Hatfield. The empty area of hangar I was standing in under a year ago is now occupied by a painted and polished aircraft. Last week, only awaiting its christening, the rollout. This is a view that very few people ever get of an aircraft, completely empty with just the system showing. These crates will house computers that will test for everything, for noise, for stress, for vibration. And that's what the rollout's all about. The aircraft is rolled out of the assembly hangar and across a couple of hundred yards to the flight test hangar. The rollout's a quaint ritual, and now it's become so wrapped up in aviation motion that the original engineering purpose is all but forgotten. A question from the management showed us the way the day was going to go. Can you take a photo of all the men that actually built the aircraft, they asked. So here they are, the tip of the iceberg supported by thousands. From all over Hatfield they came. Most bring cameras to welcome the first British civil airliner for 18 years with a thousand flashes for the scrapbook. I feel proud that we've been, we've been able to be just a little part of it, even to keep them well and fit that they can work on the aircraft. <laughs> You're even working today? Yes. Don't you ever take any days off? No, not lately. While the finishing touches are being made, the press are invited to a conference for a coincidental announcement. The aircraft is beginning to sell where it counts most, in America. I'm very happy to tell you that Air Wisconsin, uh, a major US commuter, have just announced that they've decided to buy four aircraft and taken an option on a further four. Uh, moreover, the US operator West Air has announced board approval to purchase six. The skeptics are for the moment silenced. If all the initial options materialize, there'll be enough work to keep the 146 going until the spring of 1983. <laughs> What came into the assembly hangar in bits and pieces is now ready to leave as a finished aircraft. All the people that have helped can stand back and watch their work presented to the public for the very first time. How do you feel today seeing it finally there? Well, having uh, worked here for 40 years, it's a uh, great happening, yes. What did you do towards that? Well, I'm an aircraft inspector. Gradually, the real purpose of the rollout becomes apparent. It's a birthday party for an aircraft. As it rolls down the runway, the day gains momentum. It's now in no way a functional procedure to move the aircraft from assembly to test. Instead, it's a jamboree of congratulations, a cross between a sales drive and a parade. The unveiling of an aircraft is a very class-conscious thing. 
The VIPs on the podium made speeches. The 300 executives in suits sit behind applauding. The actual aircraft builders stood in overalls, just occasionally clapping before going off to lunch. The central band of the Royal Air Force played noisily in the background, while the executives had their booth air. Throughout the day, in spite of the bunting and bands, the receptions and speeches, it was obvious there was only one star, the aircraft. A team effort from all over the world. The first phase was now ended. As the designer, I presume your job's now finished? Well, no, it's far from finished. Um, we've now rolled out the aeroplane, and really, the hard work starts from now. Between now and first flight, we have an enormous amount of pre-flight testing to do. This is mostly structural resonance testing. We have to function all the systems. We then have to prepare it for flight by running the engines, making sure all the radio works. Then, of course, when we fly the aeroplane, we even start even more hard work to get the aeroplane to perform correctly before we sell it to the airlines and certificate the aeroplane. So you might have, what, another year or two's work on it? Oh, I shall probably have another three or four years' work on it. We have roughly 15 months from when we fly the aeroplane to certificate the aeroplane, but of course the job doesn't stop then. We have to get it into airline service and it has to be satisfactory to the airlines. Gradually, everyone went back to work. The bunting was taken down, the tables, flowers and podium cleared away as the flight test hangar once again went back to its functional norm and the aircraft was left to its testers. For the next 10 weeks, it'll go through a series of ground checks and monitoring equipment will be added. Nearly every stress point will be wired up, every heat point get its own thermometer. Then sometime in the early summer, probably with no prior announcement and few if any witnesses, the 146 will slip out of its new hangar to the end of the runway. The test pilot will go through the final countdown and the 146 will quietly, very quietly, take to the air for the first time. After watching an aircraft assembled bit by bit over two years, the first flight was an anticlimax. To keep the pressure off the engineers, it's a private, unheralded occasion, with no press or officials invited. A day for the aircraft builders. The fundamental question was never asked, and no one was even thinking it. Of course it would fly, with not the slightest scrap of doubt. It's the test pilot who decides. The senior engineers have a discussion, and when each has approved, the final decision is taken by the pilot. No announcement is made. The aircraft simply takes to the air. The anticlimax was heightened by the lack of noise. The 146 is astonishingly quiet. The salesmen amongst the audience rub their hands. Silence, already an important sales factor, would begin to dominate their thinking. Already the 146 is selling well, yet more confirmation that it's the unexceptional that airlines buy. So far there are orders or options for 25, and many more expected now the aircraft has flown. A modern, computer-built, economical feeder liner now starts the most difficult phase of its life, into the marketplace. <laughs> 